Welcome to uh, this next session of Merging Mindsets. Uh, it'll be a panel discussion on projection mapping and large scale uh, projection. Uh, today's panel is part of a larger program of activities designed to expand opportunities for artists to create a uh, larger program of activities, uh, sorry, designed uh, artists to create uh, using digital technologies while broadening connections with interactive digital media, uh, IDM, uh, related companies that want to innovate using creative talent. Uh, Merging Mindsets is an exciting series of community building events exploring the digital tech in art and the art in digital tech while connecting the people in between. Uh, in cities around the world, the creative arts and interactive digital media sectors are bringing their respective skills together to imagine and create exciting new events at arts and art and products, merging dig digital technologies with artistic practice. In Manitoba, we're ready to showcase what our vibrant arts community and interactive digital media sector can do together. Um, Merging Mindsets is a joint project of Creative Manitoba, New Media Manitoba, and Video Pool Media Arts Centre. And we want to acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, who funded this through their Digital Strategy Fund. Um, so before, just before we move on to the panelists, uh, I just want to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 1 territory, which is the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, uh, Dakota, Dene, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, I also just want to say that uh, as a relative newcomer to this land, uh, my, my, myself and my family, we've been made to feel uh, very welcome here. Um, and I feel that it is important within the context of a land acknowledgement that we also acknowledge the systemic injustices that have allowed us to be on this land uh, and that we strive to not only recognize these disparities, uh, but that we are active in working towards an equitable and fair society. Um, I also just want to note that uh, it's our intent uh, that these events foster a supportive, non-threatening environment for everyone to participate and share in, regardless of gender, ability, ethnicity, or cultural differences. We ask that you all um, please be welcoming and respectful of worldviews that may differ from your own. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about projection mapping and large-scale projection. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to have, we have these experts uh, assembled here today. They're going to answer a bunch of questions at the end. Um, uh, first, uh, we're going to go through each panelist. We'll have uh, 15 to 20 minutes to the, where they can they'll talk about their particular uh, focus, um, and then uh, there'll be uh, I'll ask a few questions, uh, and uh, it'll, we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, so I'm just going to I'll quickly go through some of the bios of the folks that are here, and then we'll uh, get on with it. All right. So. Um, <clears throat> Directly beside me here is uh, Hugh Conacher. Hugh is a lighting and multimedia designer uh, and a photographer whose practice is based in live performance. He has collaborated, collaborated with choreographers, directors, visual artists, and dance and theater companies throughout Canada and around the world. In venues large and small, he approaches each project as an individual work of art. Um, so Hugh's work, the foundation of which is 35 years as a lighting designer, straddles the worlds of lighting design, new media technologies, projection, and photography, blurring the lines between disciplines using whichever medium form best serves the vision of his current project. So he likes to take the static space of the stage and turn it into an immersive environment with light and projection created specifically for the project. Uh, from light and projection, he develops form a uh, form that living bodies interact with. He brings together the ephemeral medium of light, including projection with living bodies and new technologies in a conversation, the collective result of which is more than its individual parts. Uh, so maybe what we'll do is I'll, I'll do each bio as we go to each person, because otherwise you'll, you'll just totally forget. Uh, so, uh, Hugh, do you want to? I've already forgotten. Um, <laughs> Said everything I was going to say. Can somebody can you switch me over? To I can, yeah. So I'm going to start with a couple of things that inspire me. This is a company called Chunky Move from uh, Australia. The video design is by a guy named Frieder Weiss from Germany. 
Well, let's watch it for a minute. So that's just a little intro, intro to a, a, a half hour long dance piece. And it was one of the first pieces I ever saw that had um, uh, that used projection exclusively as a way to light a dancer. And as you probably noticed, it's interactive. Uh, as the dancer moves, the projection follows them. And they do that by, by uh, using infrared uh, camera technology from above. And the dancer in this particular piece is on the floor the entire time. And it's quite a small stage. Um, I'll, just, I'll just maybe I'll play it again while I just chat about it. And, uh, now some sound. Uh, it's quite a small stage, um, as you can see, not that much bigger than you know two or three lengths of the dancer. So it enables uh, uh, Frieder to uh, to use one camera and one projector and then software to interpret the dance in light. This is an old piece from, I think, 2009 or 2008. So the technology isn't nearly as advanced then as it is now. Um, but this is one of the first things that I saw that really inspired me to get into this kind of work. This is another one. And do you know this? You said old. Yes. In this piece, the dancer is contained in four walls, and the audience sits on four sides and, can, and, and sees, uh, sees into the cube, as it were. And again, it's interactive, and the dancer is essentially controlling the video with, with their gestures. So, um, I, worked as, I, I have worked as a lighting designer for a long, long, long time. And um, after about 20 years, I found myself getting bored and not, uh, finding, not feeling challenged by anything that I was doing, even though like, individual projects are sometimes technically challenging, not feeling artistically challenged. And, and then I started seeing work like this. And it made me realize that there's a whole new world out there in terms of creativity with light that doesn't necessarily involve traditional theatrical techniques. And so I've taken the idea of using interactivity in theater and projection and uh, projected light 
uh, and, and imagery uh, as a source of light to, uh, for, for uh, theater and dance and live performance. In fact, I've been doing this actually since the 80s, but I didn't even realize it. Back in the 80s, I used slide projectors and slides to do essentially the same sort of thing. Not, not moving imagery, of course, but, but um, and then Edward Locke, uh, who's a choreographer from Montreal who I worked with for a while, started using 16 millimeter projections. So even back in the, in the olden days, people were doing stuff like this, but it, I hadn't actually made the connection in my own brain until much more <coughs> recently. And then in 2009, I was lucky enough to go to, uh, uh, to New York to work with a guy named um, Mark Congello, who wrote, writes a piece of software called Isadora, but is also a, 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 almost one of the originators of, of video uh, work, interactive video work in dance. Uh, which he's been doing since the mid-2000s, or maybe even earlier, I can't remember. Anyway, I learned about Isadora with him for a few weeks and um, have been using it ever since to, to make new work uh, on, on stages. Uh, in Winnipeg, we uh, theater and dance companies in Winnipeg are well known for making beautiful, wonderful, creative work on zero budgets, and that's a real problem when it comes to projection because it costs money, right? Anything to do with video is expensive. So what I ended up doing was, because nobody had the equipment in town, um, and the AV companies that were willing to rent it to us, they charged far too much money for it. Uh, and so I ended up buying all my own gear. So even to this day, I'm still using projectors that I bought in 2009 for my first gig, because they weren't great. Why wouldn't you still use them? But I've since, of course, upgraded them to, to newer and brighter and better and all higher resolution and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, uh, but it's the only way I was able to find that I could uh, make the work that I wanted to do was to be able to provide all my own gear. Um, so I'm going to show a few pictures now of work and talk about it. This is the this is the very first piece I ever. Oh, you want me to actually hold it? Yes, please. I hate these things. <laughs> this is the very first piece I. And now I need another. This is the very first piece I ever did with, uh, that, that involved projection, and it's a solo dance. Jolene Bailey created the dance, and I did the lighting and projection for it. And it was at the University uh, of Winnipeg Theatre, the Asper Center for Performing Arts. And um, uh, we, it, it was the very first show that was ever in the theatre. They literally just finished building it. And most of it uh, was, you know, there wasn't any curtains, there wasn't any seats, there was nothing in there. It was just basically an empty building, but it had a fantastic grid and a series of catwalks in the ceiling. So we uh, designed a, a, a method whereby we could use the entire space and all of its various levels, including the catwalks that are only supposed to be for the technicians, as performance space. And then the audience sat um, on what is supposed to be the side wall of the theater. We made it the back and looked up, essentially, and they were on the ground as well. So in this one, you can see that Jolene, the, the green tinge is the, is, is the color of the light from the projector. Um, but this was basically almost all lit with projections and a little bit of theatrical lighting as well, which we'll see as we go through them. Um, one of the things I discovered I liked a lot about the projected light was the pixelization and seeing the, the, the little pixel grid uh, on people's skin because it makes it looks like makes them look like robots in real life. We didn't make an effort to hide anything at all in the thing, which is why you saw the exit sign in the last one. And here you can see underneath the catwalk there's a television set. I put cameras in the um, going down all the lines of the uh, of the catwalks. Uh, shooting what she was doing in the catwalk and then put it on television sets underneath the catwalk so that people could see it more clearly because, of course, the catwalks actually blocked phys physically what people could see in some, in some cases. Somebody could always see something um, live, but not always everything. There's another one that the TV... More TVs... This is a digital uh, waterfall that we put on her. That, um, this is one of my favorite bits. I made a wall of TVs at the back of the stage and, um, and, and sent uh, video imagery to them. And it became sort of like a backdrop for her, in addition to all the projected light that was on the stage that was lighting her. 
And you can see the, the beautiful pixelization of the projector on her skin. In this particular case, I'd, um, put, I'd put things called IQ mirrors on the end of the projector so they become like moving lights essentially because I could then take, the, the mirror t takes the uh, image and reflects it in whatever direction it happens to be pointing and it's computer controlled by the lighting system and so it could, I could take the imagery of the projector and just point it anywhere in the space and I had three or four of those I think. Um, in this case, uh, we, uh, the whole thing was about TVs and, it was, uh, and about monitoring and, and, and sort of the idea of Big Brother and all that kind of stuff. And so we had different sizes of TVs. This is a giant TV, but it was actually, of course, a screen with a projector behind it. And there's a camera there shooting up at her and, uh, and then uh, taking the image and, and uh, interpreting it through the software and, and spitting it out again onto the, onto the screen below her. In that particular case, that's a camera shooting down from on top, which I've messed around with the image and then and, um, uh, put it onto the screen. So in all in all, I think, I can't remember exactly. This was, this, was a long, this was 10 years ago. So if I remember correctly, there was, uh, oh, there was about 40 TVs. And there was uh, one, two, three, six projectors, I think, or eight projectors and about the same number of cameras, all controlled through this thing. One of the few bits of theatrical light in the show. <laughs> and this was at the end of the show. There was roses falling down on her, and the projected image was that of a clock. This watch, actually, <laughs> which I filmed close up, is going tick, 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 with the second hands going around on her. And that's, I think that's the end of that. Um, next up. Uh, many of you will know Freya Olofsson. My very first uh, first big collabor full collaboration with her was a show called Avatar. I don't know when was that. Does anybody remember? Like 2011 maybe? And uh, in it, she had created a bunch of video material and uh, the, I, her, her concept was that the, uh, uh, that the video material would be displayed behind her and she would dance in front of it. And a lot of it was interactive because she had a camera on her computer on that table there. You can see it in, in silhouette there. And I took that idea and went further with it and took, uh, took a lot of the imagery that she had created, but also some of my own imagery that I created, and hung projectors on the sides of the stage, uh, shooting sort of down like in a sort of a tippy kind of uh, way, and uh, would light the white floor in front of the screen. So. Uh, in an attempt to marry the, the lighting and the, her video imagery together. Um, so this was an, uh, a lot of the stuff she was doing was around the idea of keyboards, and so this was sort of a keyboard thing that I, idea that I came up with. I never like to be too literal. This was using actually the same video that, um, uh, that she was using, but in the light to light her as well. I think this was very successful. And again, it was an early, one of my early attempts at how do, you, how do you marry what the visual artist is, in this case, visual artist is trying to do and, and tell, help tell the story through the lighting. And um, yeah. And that's it for that. Um, then, a couple of years later, uh, Wanda Coop, another visual artist here in town, who many of you will know, uh, got together with Jolene Bailey and me and Susan Chafe, and we created a work called Hybrid Human. And it was, it was to be part of her installation at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and then it went on to the, uh, the National Gallery in Ottawa. And uh, she um, uh, was doing these huge, <laughs> Karen, stop it. She was doing these huge, large form, <laughs> large form paintings, um, two by three, uh, sorry, three by four meters. And um, uh, 
based on the idea of, of, of a hybrid human, a robotic human, and, and what that meant to her. And so we, we all ran with that idea as well and came up with a performance piece. And I'm going to show you some pictures of it first, and then I'll show you a little bit of video. So these are the big paintings that, in the, that were in the back gallery on the third floor of the, of the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And I lit the, the large paintings with, with theatrical lights, but then I also lit away from the painting as, it, as if the light was creating the light that was on the, on the person in front of the painting. And this was always on through, through, uh, through, the, uh, through the exhibition, um, but it was also used in performance as well by the dancers, as you can see. Here we're in the performance space, and that's a pretty big wall, as you can see. It's, I, I don't remember the exact size, but it, it was huge. And I had to use, in, in those days, the projection technology wasn't uh, very great. This is 2011. And we uh, used several projectors on top of each other to make it bright, to make the image bright enough. And, and I mapped it so that, um, I, so that it actually all fitted into there, and I was quite impressed by how well it, it went together. And it was my first attempt to put multiple images well, put the same image multiple times onto the same surface and make it, make it cohesive and understandable. Uh, and then in the lighting, these are actually lights, not projections. I had eight moving lights um, and use them to sort of replicate the, uh, uh, the idea of the video and the paintings into the light that was hitting the dancers. And all of this stuff is interactive, so the moving lights all move. Um, but that's controlled by a computer in the, in the light, a lighting console. But the video is all controlled by the dancers and, as well as by me. So there's cameras all over the place and as they go through certain zones in, 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 in the space, they trigger different events to happen in the video. That's one of my favorite tricks and it's something I do a lot. <laughs> And here you can see quite clearly how the dancer is controlling what, what, what is in the video because it actually looks the same, <laughs> uh, which isn't often the case. But sometimes you want to give a little bit of a hint to the audience about what they're actually seeing, but not make it too, ob but not make it too obvious. Uh, that's the end of the slide. So uh, a couple of little bit, short bits of video. This is a very short bit. Here, I wanted to put this one up because in this you can see this, basically the setup of, uh, of the stage. There's audience on two sides, so the camera is in one section of audience, uh, and then you can see the other audience, so they're looking at each other across the thing. One of the large format paintings in the back, the blue one, uh, behind the audience there, always has uh, this vision of Jolene crawling up a cliff face throughout the entire show and, and indeed throughout the entire exhibition. The big screen, the one over here, um, is uh, the dance, what happens uh, with, uh, the, with the dancers and the dancer-controlled video. This is just a short thing. You can see a little bit of it on the screen how it works there. And then, this is a, a slightly longer couple of minutes of, of the excerpt.
when I'm asked to do video for a show, I, the first thing I, I ask both the people who are asking me to do it and myself is why? Because often it's, it's extraneous. Often it doesn't help to tell the story and it's just like people do use video in performances because it's so cool to use video in performances, right? And that's completely the wrong reason to do it as far as I'm concerned. There has to be an actual uh, art artistic reason to, uh, to, uh, to add that toolbox to your kit um, because if there isn't, it always looks like it's just an extraneous, you know, it, it means nothing. So this is a, um, a production I did of Angels in America, um, the part one of Angels in America. And it's, uh, it's a fantasy as well as, as well as a very real story about, um, I'm sure many of you know, but, but it's a fantasy as, very, as well as a very real story about living with AIDS. And um, we use the video both to reinforce the, the, the environment that the, the reality was taking place in, but also to demonstrate the fantasy. For example, that's just a, a shot out their, uh, out their bedroom window. It's a New York street scene, right? Um, I, I, like to, I like to shoot as much of my content as I can um, or, or make it in one way or another. Sometimes, though, for stuff like this, the internet is your best friend. <laughs> because I'm, they wouldn't pay me to go to New York to shoot street scenes, sadly. Um, so there's th that shows the whole stage. And, and the three screens. So the, the, the big one over there, that's huge. I think it was about 15 by 20, if I remember correctly. And these ones are obviously much smaller. Um, and I use them basically to, to create environments for, for, for each of the, the scenes in the play. And I also, again, had moving lights in this one, so I could take the, because there's no projection on any of the actors in this one, it's just light, but you can get these, a similar sort of feel to, for, uh, as you would get in a projection with, um, uh, by using various sort of tricks in the trade, like out of focus gobos and, and moving lights, just gently and quietly moving in the background and stuff like that. So there's a bit of a fantasy thing. Something's just blown up <laughs> behind them, which is the flame. And we reflect that in the light as well. This one I liked because it's, it's the idea was this is a, a homeless person and, and uh, they've got a fire in the garbage can and I was able to put a, put a light going straight down to the garbage can that had moving stuff in it that reflected up onto them as they got close to it. And, um, made it appear as though there actually was uh, fire, but the rest of it around them is quite cold and wintry and bleak. I did use a little bit of interactivity in this one as well. And this is, um, he's having, a, he's having a, a, a fantastical nightmare and she's a ghost. And the wallpaper on the wall, which is behind her, through the scene very slowly distorts. It's hardly noticeable, but by the end of the scene it looks like this. At the beginning it just looks, looks like sort of gray wallpaper on a, on a thing, on, on, on a wall, and it just sort of melts and becomes this distorted weird thing. Am I running out of time? How much? Okay, well that's not running out of time. <laughs> um, yeah. So here he's having his epiphany and is coming to a climax, so to speak. And then at the very end of the play, the angel appears. The wall breaks apart and the angel appears. So that's the end of that one. Um, what should I do? I've got five minutes. I've got lots of time. So this is a, a play called. Uh, a dance piece called Sensory Life Infinite World, again by Gear Shifting Performance Works. And this was the first sort of large scale thing, the large scale thing that I tried to do with video and dance. Um, I had several projectors overhead shooting down and several projectors at the back shooting onto the back wall, just cr to create an environment for the, uh, for the dancers to perform under. 
And I'm going to show you a little bit of video from this, too. I've always thought that the most important thing in, in, in when using video on stage is there needs to be a time in the play or the dance when the video is the priority of what people are looking at. And then there needs to be a time when it's not there. When, you get, when, you get to, when, when the brain gets to visually or intellectually rest or emotionally rest for a moment. And so you don't. So this is that moment in that, in, in that dance piece where there's just no video. It's just a single light lighting the thing in the middle. And um, then we move on to the next bit. So I'll just, um, this is just a couple of minutes to demonstrate how that works. A lot of people, when they look at this, they say, why didn't you loop the video so that it had a seamless transition? To which my answer is, is sometimes it's important to understand that what you're actually look, looking at is messed up and it's not real. And so it just goes like that and it makes you, clicks your brain back into action again. And indeed, not only does video move, but light can also move. Next bit will demonstrate. talk about a play I did called No Exit, uh, Sartre's No Exit. And, and this is interesting because this is more directly in, uh, involves actual video mapping. Video mapping to me is just a technique by which you display, by which you allow images to be displayed on a surface, right? So all of these surfaces are, are these shapes and, and they all move throughout the play. And so every single time they moved, they had to remap all the video on the thing. And this was done with just two projectors coming in diagonally from the front on two sides. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, there's, this is, this is uh, uh, footage from actually, a, a, I think it was a BBC production of, of, of No Exit uh, that I used as a background. And this is stuff that I shot, rain coming through a window. There was also live camera stuff. And then this is my wallpaper trick. I love wallpaper in plays. Projecting wallpaper is awesome because look what it does to the people too, right? <laughs> um, live camera so here she's being filmed from the front while she does stuff and then it's a delay a delay playback so that it doesn't match what she's actually doing on the stage in the moment and then this is a, a moment where it does match what she's doing on the stage the woman sitting behind her has got a camera in her hand you can see it and she's doing a close-up of her putting on her makeup there every time the things move the video has to be remapped and surfaces, and which makes it fun when they're actually moving. <laughs> and here, hell starts to close in on them at the very end of the play. They're surrounded in their claustrophobic environment. We get to see through it because it's scrim, uh, but the flames of hell are engulfing them. I think that's all I have time for. Fantastic. Thank you, Hugh. Um, And maybe uh, just before we before we uh, move on, I just um, uh, I just I wanted to point out because I'm sitting next to Hugh here, and so I can see that you're not using a typical sort of PowerPoint, no. <laughs> which I think I just wanted to point it out because I think it's really great. Uh, Lawrence works in architecture and media art. Uh, his artistic practice focuses on the relationship of image to space, and often involves projection mapping satellite and aerial imagery into public spaces. The intention is to return the image to spaces that matter to its harvesting. This work has been installed at Raw Gallery, the Forks National Historic Site, uh, Inter Access Gallery, Further Field Gallery, Greenwich, uh, a whole list of spaces. I won't go through them all. Uh, Lawrence also teaches and writes, including for Leonardo. He's currently co-editing a book on Winnipeg's warming huts. 
Lawrence has a PhD in history and theory of architecture and a professional degree in architecture, both from McGill University, uh, and a master's degree in city design and social science from London. His research has been funded by SHIRK, FQRSC, the Canada Council for the Arts, Manitoba Arts Council, and Winnipeg Arts Council. Is that okay? Check one, check two? Okay. Uh, so thanks very much to the organizers, Emma for the introduction, and uh, Hugh and Faisal. Um, really interesting to see your work. Sure. Um, and to everyone for coming out on such a cold day. So my name's Lawrence. Um, as I said, as Emma was saying, uh, my background is actually in architecture. Uh, so everything in, I know in media art is self-taught or learned through, um, very often through interaction with students or participation in workshops and so on. Um, and my background is also in history and theory of architecture. So I'm very interested, the, what interests me about media is the interaction between uh, mediated spaces and uh, digital images and materiality, uh, architectural spaces. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just launch into it. So uh, a few years ago, I started to do some research into Google Earth. And there are a number of artists working with Google Earth, actually, in different uh, tools in Google. Um, uh, Mishka Henner, for example, um, who is a Dutch-born, British-based um, artist who works with uh, uh, finding anomalies in Google Earth and what they say very often about surveillance and about control of space and the control of the image of space. John Raffman, who's based in Montreal, who uses Google Street View um, to come up with some very compelling uh, and disturbing images. Um, and what interests me about Google Earth is actually how it can be twisted in that way. Uh, so that it's sort of, it, it is in principle um, a development of the Enlightenment project to map the Earth perfectly, however it fails. And so my question is, here we are, two or three centuries into the promise of a map of the Earth, uh, which is perfect, um, and yet it continues to fail. So why is that? So just to start with one image, uh, this is what kind of got me onto this line of research. Um, what you see here is an image captured from Google Earth. And on the left-hand side, you see a field. I'm just gonna set, hang on a second. You see one field uh, plowed by a human being and an animal or a machine. And on the right, you see another field, a digital field. Now this is simply an artifact of the imaging uh, in Google Earth where it has failed. We're used to the overall view of Google Earth. As soon as you zoom in to the smaller scale and as soon as you uh, activate the Google Earth history image, historical image function, uh, you start to come up with these anomalies all over the place. Uh, that's actually what really interests me. Um, there is a philosopher, Bernard Stiegler, who's written uh, a number of works on, on uh, why it is that the image, uh, or the, the orthographic image, um, which promises us this perfection, inevitably fails. Uh, there so this is simply one example of that. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about three projects. One is called Parallel, the other is called, another is Transect, and the last one is Dominion. And they each look at our attempts to orthographically map. So this is about a different kind of projection mapping that nevertheless works its way into the projection mapping we're talking about. <clears throat> this is the 49th parallel, the border between Canada and the United States, which in around uh, the second half of the 19th century um, was mapped. Uh, Canada, the, the line was, was uh, defined between, sorry, Canada and the United States in the Louisiana Purchase, um, but it wasn't actually mapped until uh, the second half of the 19th century. It was mapped with a lot of errors. And even though Canadians think of the 49th parallel as the border, it's not actually. The border is those accumulated errors that is still by definition the international border. So the first project that I worked on in this area was called Parallel, which simply followed that border for 2,000 miles from the Pacific Ocean to uh, Lake of the Woods. And the intention of the project was, I'm just gonna skip you through it. Uh, there is some audio here, I can hear it at the moment, but. Um, the intention of the project was to identify the anomalies on the two different sides of the border. A lot of this imagery is from around 2,000 
here, I think, is that there's kind of a, uh, essentially when a lot of these images were taken, Google did not have any interest in what was going on. That was the first project. Uh, just for a little technical information, so this is done very primitively, uh, quick time screen ca capture. Um, for 2,000 kilometers, simply flicking on the trackpad. Uh, it's a, it was a single channel video uh, at a one to two ratio, a duration of two hours. This is shown in InterAccess Gallery. Uh, and essentially, it's a drone flight across the border. Uh, that audio is, uh, I generally collect stuff which is free. <laughs> Um, but there were three sources, ambient nothingness, which is from, uh, which I collected from the Internet Archive, ambient sound from the Japanese uh, experimental module, the International Space Station, um, and audio from a Predator B drone, uh, which is actually the drones that monitor, they're not weaponized, as they are in other parts of the world, but they do monitor that border. So the next project I'd like to talk about is Transect, which follows another line. So the 49th parallel is a parallel. Transect follows the Greenwich Prime Meridian. So as Prime Meridian runs through Greenwich from the North Pole to the South Pole, and on the opposite side of the world, there is an anti-meridian. And this project was about harvesting images from both of those meridia. Essentially, it's a path of travel all the way around the planet. And it passes through Greenwich. So just a few words about Greenwich. Uh, <coughs> so Greenwich was the fulcrum, the center of British power. And the project to map the world uh, was based here and is obviously related to the process of, processes of uh, colonization. There are actually several prime meridia. If you go to Greenwich, <coughs> you will have the opportunity to hop back and forth across the prime meridian. The most, most recent one, <coughs> set in 1851 uh, by Sir George Airy, which was actually the fourth. Um, they're lined up next to each other, those dotted lines there. And this became, in the International <coughs> Meridian Conference in 1884, uh, the global prime meridian. <coughs> Again, another demonstration of British power. Actually, that line that you jump uh, back and forth across in Greenwich is a lie uh, because it's inaccurate. Essentially, it was mapped using a plumb line down to the center of the Earth, but the Earth is uh, not evenly, the center of gravity is not the same as the center of the Earth. The line on the right, the yellow line, is the prime meridian, which you will see if you go into Google Earth. Okay. This is actually not, <coughs> this is now um, based on a military, uh, American military, um, mapping of the world, um, and it's no longer related to that earlier prime meridian. So the Royal Observatory is where the prime meridian goes through, and it's part of a complex of building, buildings known as the Greenwich Royal Naval Hospital, which was designed by Sir Christopher Wren and uh, completed by Nicholas Haw Hawksmore, two um, very important architects. And projection that happened here uh, took place at Queen Anne Court, which is part of that complex. So this is an interior court, and the projection was carried out on that facade there. So essentially, there are two images here collected, harvested along the prime meridian and the anti-meridian on the other side. One is projected on the pilasters, the columns, and one is project projected onto the facade um, over a period of about an hour and a half, and then they flip. And one of the things that really interests me here is how the architecture is kind of melted by the image. You end up with a kind of a hybrid of, of different uh, uh, digital materiality. It's not uh, material and it's not simply image and the architecture kind of dissolves. So just a little technical information. Uh, this is getting a little bit more sophisticated where it was following a path set out and a tour set out in Google Earth. <coughs> Um, but also still the QuickTime screen capture of the moving image using Premiere Pro to edit it together and then samples taken from the different sides and projected. The audio was simply rain. Uh, so the final project uh, is Dimedian. Now a few years ago, looking at Google, the prairies in Google Earth for the first time, 
I notice how pixelated they look. And it, my first reaction was, the reason for this is uh, processing of the Google image, of, of the satellite imagery by Google. Uh, so there's some kind of uh, artifacting um, going on. That's partly true, but actually the real reason is that the prairie is literally pixelated. It was divided up by the Dominion Land Survey in 1871, or that's when the process began, uh, broken into squares. Um, and each of those squares has a different crops in it. And that is the reason for this image. It's a rather unnerving to me similarity between what Photoshop and other pro uh, programs do to the image, which is take, to take something which is whole, to break it into parts so that you can manipulate them. That's exactly what the Dominion Land Survey does to, uh, to the prairies. It takes something which was whole, cuts it up, and then manipulate, manipulates it. So in a sense, it's a giant CPU. So the Dominion Land Survey, and I apologize if this is becoming too much of a history lecture, uh, covers about 800,000 square kilometers of Western Canada, cutting it into this grid. And it was instigated in 1871, part of a colonial project. We're still living in the results of that. Uh, to basically make Western Canada as rapidly colonizable as possible. So the prairies, this is from, there was a manual put out by the Canadian government, how to survey the Dominion lands. It was divided up into townships of 36 uh, square miles. And I've always been struck by how compelling these images are from that manual. This is how to build the posts at the corners. And this is how to lay out the mounds when you can't build a post. These really resonate for me with it, the notion of a dagger into the land or funerary monuments. That's effectively what they were. <coughs> so there was a devastating impact on the people who were here first, of course. Some squares were dedicated to Indian reserves. Uh, there's a number of anomalies where the DLS, the Dominion Land Survey, fails to map the prairies correctly or consistently. And you can see them, uh, right here you see an image where on the top you have the DLS and it's kind of colliding with uh, the Métis long lot, si long lot system, uh, which you can see in St. Andrews, <coughs> these lines following the river. But basically a grid is not a very appropriate way to uh, map or survey um, a, a natural body. And so there are other anomalies, uh, natural forms, rivers which change every year, uh, lakes which disappear and come back as sloughs in the spring. And in fact, you can't even map a globe with a, a grid effectively. So you're aware, I'm sure, of the notion of the correction line. If you try and place a grid, a, a rectilinear grid onto a globe, you have to tweak it here and there, and that's what correction lines do. So this perfect system for mapping fails right off the bat, even within its own parameters. So what all this thinking did <laughs> was um, to produce this Project Dominion, which was installed uh, here at the Forks National Historical Site. Uh, last year as part of the Winnipeg Design Festival. Uh, we have a number of railway bridges there. One of them is pedestrianized, and over top of that one, there is an immense concrete counterweight, which was designed to allow the bridge to raise and lower. Uh, now, that was a railway bridge, and the railways were part of that system, which harvested the prairies, the crops from the prairies. It was integral to the idea of the DLS. So the intention was to bring these images harvested from the DLS, uh, back into the place that they belong. It's been installed in a number of other places and it's adapted each time for the, for the architectural setting. But essentially what I did was I took uh, 16 trajectories across uh, the prairies in different parts, uh, following <laughs> and sometimes diverging from the lines of the DLS. Um, using Isadora. The first project, the, the earlier project Transect, was simply Mad Mapper, which is a very easy to learn uh, tool. Um, I used Isadora in this case because I wanted to get an interaction between the audio, and there should actually be audio here.
but it's not crucial. Uh, essentially, using Isadora, uh, there are a number of very cool tools, and I'll show you a few in a second. <laughs> um, Isadora is designed for interaction, especially interaction with the human body. So Hugh's using it the right way. Okay, I'm using it the wrong way. Uh, there are a number of tools where, which you can use to capture portions of an image and uh, use the intensity, the speed of the movement in that image to, uh, to modulate sound, essentially. So I have a few different audio sources in this project. Uh, one of them is railway sound. Uh, another is text-to-speech. Okay, the manual for uh, build, building the DLS um, was read by my computer. Uh, samples were taken of it. Um, and it was modulated according to the image as it was crossing the screen at the time it was done. So what you see, that large image there, is actually the raw material that went into this project. Um, now, Isadora, just a warning, it has conflicts, uh, apparently, which I've read about, um, with uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, and I just... Only on a Mac. Only, <laughs> only on a Mac, in the latest version of the Macintosh operating system. So, yes, I stand <laughs> admonished for using a Mac. Um, I hadn't actually experienced that myself until this morning <laughs> when I was putting together this presentation. It was quite disastrous. <laughs> Um, and I had to sort of revert to an earlier version of this presentation. But in the top right corner, what you can see is a time lapse of the projection. So it's not quite giving you the effect, but you can see that there's a, there is, um, let me, I'm just going to zoom forward to a portion where it's quite, where it's a little more obvious. So essentially you can see the image there divided into six parts coming apart, and then another image is coming in on top of it. So what I'm using Isadora to do there is uh, to have two videos playing almost on top of each other in cyberspace, right? And they move back and forth. And as they move back and forth, one disappears and the other dominates. Okay. Divided into six to work with the architecture of that, uh, the steel over top, uh, which has a sort of a six uh, truss divided into six pieces. Uh, so essentially you have a satellite view um, interacting or coming, passing back and forth with a, uh, something closer to um, a ground level view, as you see here. Now, one of the things that's most interesting about what Google does with the image, to me anyway, is that it creates this map of the, this three-dimensional model, which is generated live in front of you. So if you can screen capture as it's generating, then it kind of, uh, you capture these landscapes forming and then dis kind of disassembling. And you can see them on the screen there popping up the grid. Uh, and again, this is about how Google fails to create a perfect model of the Earth. So hang on a second. I just want to go back to that. Um, and assen so essentially you have those two images forming and coming into the architecture of the space. You could play a lot more with uh, varying, ex exaggerating the vertical dimension of uh, the spaces, but essentially that's it. So there is an interaction of, uh, there is a production of sound using the moving image. And I guess we can come back to some of the technical questions, but just to give you, yeah, so this is that the Isidore interface that Hugh just gave us a glimpse of. Um, but essentially what's going on here is the image itself is being mapped and that is feeding into the manipulation of the audio, which is what produces the audio that you didn't hear, but <laughs> you get the idea. And uh, just to close with the final image, you know, that shows all of those fields one more time. You have the DLS up here on the left. You have these long lots down here, and then you have the digital image there. I just find this really compelling, um, this kind of image really compelling as an architect. Uh, and Emma mentioned that, um, yeah, I, I work with Sputnik Architecture, who are the, the people who put together the Warming Huts project. Uh, so that's, I spent the last three days on the ice harvesting at Fort White, so hopefully we'll have enough ice this year, we're not entirely sure. Um, 
but the plan is for more projects like this in the future uh, involving more of an, inter uh, an interaction between image and, and architecture. That's about it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. That was fascinating. Uh, okay. Um, so just while we're, I guess I'll, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll introduce uh, uh, Faisal. Um, so this is Faisal Anwar. He's a contemporary artist working between Canada and Pakistan. Anwar is a graduate of the Canadian Film Center's Habitat Lab Interactive Arts Program in 2004 and did his bachelor's in graphic design from the National College of Arts, Pakistan, 1996. Anwar has keen interest in exploring socio-political spaces and patterns in ecologies that intrigues the mind through multi-layered participatory experiences. His work is often interactive that utilizes public data to question how rights of access is blurring lines between private and public spaces to form a new territory. His latest project, uh, Sharba, mm -hmm. I, is that close? Yeah. Uh, 2019 presented at the exhibition Garden in the Machine at Surrey Art Gallery, Vancouver, used social media to generate a Persian-style Islamic garden known as Sharbah, for gardens. This interactive artwork grows out of Anwar's workshops with Surrey residents who took photos responding to sustainable food production, climate change, and nature. Take it away. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, well, thanks everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, um, uh, by the way, thanks for your amazing work. It's, it's amazing. Um, I think the, the, the question here is, um, what are the realities of our times? Um, and I think um, as an artist, we are all find a way to connect ourselves with, with the narrative or the medium we are working with. Uh, Marshall McLuhan's talks about medium is a message, and I think it's very relevant in, in contemporary times because our mediums are changing and our sort of um, palette or a conversation is kind of evolving. You know, consistently looming wars um, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a subject right now. Climate crisis is here now. And um, Trump running his government policies on Twitter, and I think these are really interesting times as as an artist for me to use these mediums and talk about those um, realities and create some artwork um, to to generate a dialogue and a conversation. <clears throat> so uh, back in 2003 onwards, I've been experimenting a lot with. Um, uh, 3D imagery, experimental theater, VR, AI, uh, running these different um, algorithms to, to talk about sensors and all of that into my work. But in uh, past 2008 onwards, um, I did a project, um, which is again an experimental theater, Diplomatic Immunities, with uh, Darren O'Donnell in Toronto. And part of our work is to go and randomly talk to strangers. And I think that kind of took me into this really interesting uh, perspective of um, engaging communities with the work and then finding ways to, to, to tell those stories. And I've been kind of uh, traveling, living in these different time zones, uh, different architectural spaces which we connect between these different cultures and kind of that was becoming a natural embedded sort of um, um, domains for me to explore these uh, public spaces versus private spaces and then we have these virtual spaces. We are kind of living without any borders right now. The data is actually moving faster than we travel and how it reflect uh, how we conceive and conceive all these ideas as communities, um, as a global so-called um, 
globalization format. <coughs> so I ha have been working um, with the galleries, but most of my work is outside the gallery space. I like to create these processes. I like to develop these workshops, uh, connect with communities, connect with people, and generate these conversations and use those as part of my work, um, which to me is, I think, is an interesting uh, uh, space um, for us. I mean, today we, we share all kind of personal anxieties, confessions, and wishes, and prayers in an open network. And I think that's an interesting shift as people for us. <clears throat> so uh, the project uh, Charbark, um, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple of projects, and we'll see how much time we have. Um, this was. Um, uh, a collaboration between um, the Ismaili Center in, in Al Khan Museum and uh, working with the curators. And uh, <clears throat> if you've been to Al Khan Museum, um, it's an amazing architecture. Um, they use this um, garden, which is a, a reference of these Persian garden styles back in 17th and 18th century. Um, this garden has f four divisions, and there's always a central position where the water flows. There's a significant way uh, how it connects with the space and allow audience to become part of the uh, to the structure. So it's a contemporary manifestation of 17th century garden, and I was got fascinated by this structure. Um, this is an old, um, this is the real 17th century garden where I actually was born in Lahore. So I lived with these environments, which is um, back in the day has to be a super amazing experience because of the four um, sections. In Quran, it talks about paradise and there's a whole idea about representation of these gardens. Um, so I was kind of fascinated by these structures, right? And, and to me, these are, um, these grids, um, uh, to me, kind of mapped really well with the, with the data grid, because you can kind of start looking at these sim similarities. And I was trying to figure out how I can generate something to map on these grid systems. And then these buildings have these patterns always in it. There's a symbology of these patterns. Uh, there's a cultural and social context of these patterns, which we'll not go there in detail. Uh, but they are always part of these um, kings and palaces and, um, and uh, have these very spiritual experiences of these buildings. So <clears throat> what I did, I. Um, create a um, digital garden using Instagram as a um, communication tool. So all these grids which we see are coming in real time. So we launch these hashtags, and then people are talking on those hashtags. And the algorithm is looking at, the, looking at those keywords and pairing them together and forming this tile, which is responsive and real time. So it's consistently evolving based on the conversation. It's consistently changing its form based on the conversation. <clears throat> These are a bunch of data sets, some test data, which um, I was working with. This is the data set when the new US elections were happening. The, these data sets are between Trump and Clinton. And uh, so I captured about 150,000 tweets in the course of 10 days. And then those become part of this sort of experimental um, sort of work. And then eventually it got projected on the building, uh, which is a large scale uh, um, multi-layer uh, HD projection. Um, and people, uh, the audience is actually in real time using their cell phones 
and engaging themselves into those conversations so they see themselves like their their content or their post is becoming part of the narrative so it kind of the idea of how we how we combine the virtual space with the physical space with the real space and kind of create this loop um, this audience exists in real time at the time of Nuit Blanche in Toronto, but then there's a virtual space exists and people are looking at all those data in real time. So it kind of, you know, different stages telling you. Just a quick video time lapse. So you see it's forming, it's through, throughout the course of a night, it kind of evolving and changing its, its form. So this next project is Plus City, um, supported by Shirk, um, University of Toronto. I collaborated with Siobhan, um, amazing collaborator. Um, I think what I like about these new technologies are they offer these collaborations, which I think is super fascinating. They're amazing people doing amazing work, and I think it's for us to break away from that whole idea of, of you know, doing everything on your own kind of approach, which I'm sure we all have done or still do at some point. But I think for me it's exciting to, to, to to collaborate with people, and there are amazing um, people out there who are doing amazing work. Anyways, so this is um, an, a social experiment. Uh, we created a tool to capture the social data in Toronto, especially in the context of these large um, festivals. And we were interested in looking at these patterns of how and when audience are talking about these um, these narratives and um, fr in the GTA in Toronto and what are their genders how they when they talk why they talk and kind of create this tool to, s to help the academic uh, academia in, in University of Toronto to do the research on these different uh, uh, models they're working on but part of the the research was um, to create a, um, an experience. So what we did, we launched uh, these, um, we used these open source um, tools to sort of visualize these data points. And then we kind of launched this app, which is generating these gardens in real time based on the, the data which we are pulling out of it. And then, we did an experiment, uh, a social experiment, and worked with improv uh, artists in, um, from Second City and uh, tried to create this. So it was a 360 projection. It's a large scale projection. Uh, we used uh, 12 projectors to create the whole experience. And what is happening is that these improv, so there is an audience sitting there they're actually responding, they are responding to the hashtags, which is coming here. And these improv artists are actually responding back, uh, picking all those themes from the audience, but not through one-to-one -one level. They're responding through projection, and these artists are uh, responding back to the projection. So it kind of becomes this interesting loops, uh, loop of, again, finding a way to combine the virtual space with the physical space. This was part of Nuit Blanche um, in Toronto. So, um, this was um, 
2017 biennial, which was happened in Karachi, Pakistan. And um, I was um, working with, uh, I was interested in telling, finding a way to connect with the city. I never lived in Karachi, and I wanted to connect with the, with the students. So I collaborated with uh, four schools in Karachi. And we did this um, uh, cube, which is translucent in its form, and which runs these uh, four data projectors with a bunch of sensors and a bunch of cameras, and creating these immersive space to, um, to connect with the, with, with, the, with the narrative. So it's kind of what I was hoping is to create this alternative city map, which is conceived by the locals using their cell phones. So they're taking pictures of their streets, sending all, all that data to me, and that data is actually becoming part of this, um, this experience in real time. So these are a bunch of the workshops which I've been doing with these schools, uh, with different class system in the city. And I kind of break down the city in these four layers, which is an interesting experiment for me at that time, which is still I'm working on these experiments, is to break down, see, when we take a picture, it just flatten everything, right? And, and I, was, I was trying to connect, uh, trying to break down, break these four layers into one picture. And I asked uh, students to literally take four pictures of the same spot. So you take a picture of the architecture, you go in the graffiti form, you talk, look at the people, or, and then the fourth one is the objects. And, and I think what it helped all of us to look at the city from a different perspective, because we tend to lose these details where we live and we tend to lose these cultural contexts where we live. And, and that was what I was hoping to do with this work. So all that imagery is coming in real time to this um, tool, uh, which I end up creating my own. Um, there was nothing available as, there's nothing available to support this work. And um, I, I tried, uh, touch designer, I tried a couple of different Max MSP, but uh, I was finding it a little too complicated uh, to execute this work. So I ended up creating this tool to stitch these images in real time and creating these landscapes um, uh, based on the time and time and who is, um, who is generating it. And then <coughs> finding these um, as we all know, when we take picture, we get the data with it, right? The time, the location, who is the owner, who is sending in. So I was interested in looking at all those different variables, and the tool is actually mapping those in real time to create these relationship between the time and the location, um, if that makes sense. How much time do we have? Five, five minutes? minutes? Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, in 2011, I think, I was doing some experimentation um, with the global, with the, with the data sets, um, and I was uh, commissioned a piece um, to create, um, to respond to architecture um, in, in, in Islamabad. And um, this, was a, this was a newly built building which has these uh, really interesting water ponds um, on the building. And they asked me to produce something which respond to the environment and also respond to the, to the, to the audience. So I created this large um, sculpture, which is combination of steel, um, fiberglass, and about 15,000 LED lights. It's about 36 feet tall, 
and um, um, eight feet uh, wide. And it's responding to the environment, the responding to the data sets uh, which exist in the environment, time, temperature, um, uh, the, uh, the light, and, um, and generating these patterns which are in real time responding to the situation they are in. So if it's too hot, it will change its form, it will change its uh, color, um, it's, it's mostly generative work, and it kind of keep evolving based on the circumstances it's in. Um, <clears throat> it has, um, so responding to these four variables, um, and I like to develop these works where um, it again find a way to connect with the audience. So it has an app where you can generate your own kind of um, patterns through it, and and that and when you submit your your patterns and you select your time, it sort of respond to your uh, content, your entry into it, and kind of becomes this interesting space of, of, of a piece which has multiple way to engage audience um, in, in real time. <coughs> I'll just skip this quickly. Um, this is the Surrey Art Gallery work. But I wanted to show you one thing which I'm working on now. Um, this was part of the work which I'm doing now, right now um, after my residency at, um, at uh, Rainforest, Brazil. And I'm developing this idea of um, changing the climate change depression into something hopeful. I think the science is doing amazing work and, and I think there is a there is a gap of of telling those stories in a way that it, it reaches out to an a general audience. Because the, the science's lingo is very complicated, right? They talks about these graphs, they talks about these numbers. Um, and based on my experience with these guys, is they, 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 they want to tell these stories better so that it can connect better with all of us. I mean, it becomes so abstract to, to say how I can relate with it or how, uh, what I can do to make things better. So it's an attempt to collaborate with the science, scientists to create these installations. Um, and I'm, we're you working with the birds, looking at these patterns of the birds uh, in North America, and looking at the 15 years data which they have accumulated, and try to a understand what that data point is, and then eventually predict potentially how it can change the course based on few variables um, and visually interpret those things rather than numbers so that it can connect better with us. Um, yeah, that's all. Fantastic presentations. Thank you, everybody, for all, all, your, all the work you put into those. Um, I, uh, so I'm just, I'll, I'll just go, I'm gonna do a few questions and then, <clears throat> and then I'll open it up. Um, and maybe I'll uh, uh, maybe I'll just I'll start with uh, you, Faisal. I I was just I was noticing like a lot of the uh, a lot of what you were talking about with the um, with your work is that there, you've got this publicly sourced data, and I'm wondering if um, uh, if you can talk just a, a bit about the 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 value of that for you, the publicly sourced data, the the community collaboration, um, and then. And and maybe just a little bit too about the the tools that you're using to to um, to use that data. Yeah, sure. So 
I think if we, if we look at um, the this, if we look at the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram new um, um, new numbers which they are putting out there, the users, how many users? It's astonishing to see the amount of users we have across the globe. You know, last time I saw. 60 billion people, million people are using these tools and generating these conversations. And it's interestingly enough that the countries where the lack of inf infrastructure exists, these tools become more powerful because they are empowering audience to talk about their concerns. They're empowering these audience to become part of something they 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 want to or or have these conversations around it and and i think to me it's 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 just like a, we need paint for the canvas um, it's the contemporary medium which exists so to speak right now we are all living in together 24/7 and um, it's scary and and i think for me um, it's also an opportunity for artists to to work with it, to find a better stories, to talk about how we can find a way to engage audience with these um, new type of communications. Um, and I think that's where I'm really fascinated mm -hmm. um, to use um, these um, these data, social data. Um, <clears throat> we still don't have privacy policies, even in Canada. Um, there's a there's a there's a confusion between what is privacy exists for the public, right? There's all these these um, I would say um, um, gaps exist in the policies. Um, so that's I think is an interesting gap to figure out. I end up using my, mostly using my, building my own tools um, because of the reason that sometimes technology does not allow you to do certain things. And I, I think you guys will agree, we end up either mm. finding tools which can help us to create something or we have to end up building our own um, uh, tools. So I end up building my own system uh, which is now finally robust enough, which helps me to um, capture these data points um, using these tool sets. Um, I use um, public open APIs, which is publicly available through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and it's an open, open API, anyone can use it. Um, um, and so I use those and integrate with our with my own tool sets, and then um, use uh, sometime um, generative tools like um, Touch Designer to to sort of um, create the end uh, experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks. And I, I I'm just just to quickly follow up. I'm wondering if. Uh, <laughs> If there's an influence or uh, um, I don't know, I'm not sure what the what the word is, but you know, you're using this uh, like you're obviously aware of the the you know you're talking about the privacy, uh, the, the the lack of privacy laws, uh, uh, and that all this data is publicly available. And I'm wondering if that is if part of if part of the idea is to make people aware of the fact that that data is out there, or if if it's more just utilizing the fact that that data is out there? Um, I used to worry about this, that there's a lot of data out there, but I, I don't think so we are beyond that point now. Hmm. Um, it's, I think we need some new narrative. We need, we need to not worry about we're creating so much data. Uh, it's there, it's, we like it or not, it's happening across the globe. And I think what my interest is how to still use that 
mind shift change in our perception, how we develop these conversations um, and be very open about it uh, in, in open networks, mm -hmm. use that to, to still find a better way to, um, to engage a better conversation. Right. I mean, we can go just go free floating and just say I like you or I dislike you, versus we use the same mindset to talk about the, for instance, climate crisis. Right. I mean, it's there. It's so much out there, and I think we can use social media or did these data points to um, talk to students with with these. Let them become part of that conversation. And, and create these larger conversations which can support potentially, I think in a better way, because these tools, everybody is using it now, so. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you, thanks. Um, yeah, and so then, and that, uh, Lawrence, I, I wanted to ask, um, because <clears throat> just in, in, in keeping with this idea of, the, like, of looking at this, this data, that are, are data that is publicly available. You talked a lot about uh, failure, mm, <laughs> like yeah. you know that 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 seems like the the, I guess the failure of of the 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 collection of this data or the presentation of this data or uh, how the data gets shared. There's, mm -hmm. you talked a lot about all these different failures that are, that are kind of the inspiration for a lot of your work, um, and so I just I. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about how uh, the sort of the, I guess, how failure uh, uh, and and your, how you come across data and the failures of that data, how that it really influences your, your approach to sure. your artwork and your presentations. I guess failure in what terms? Um, so the, the, the premise of, of a tool like Google Earth is it provides uh, a, a transparent, a clear and transparent um, map of the world, um, so it's a failure in that sense. You know, the, the, this is not what's provided, and I guess what is what's created is something which is analogous to an analog medium. Um, so it's been, if you look, um, the analog photo, uh, a photograph can provide basically a bottomless. Um, pool of inspiration because of the lack of clarity in it. Um, and uh, essentially that's what's happening when the Google image is breaking down. Um, that there is, uh, yeah, this, this, these juxtapositions and superimpositions of image which uh, were never intended by the, the original designers. Um, by anywhere, anyone, anywhere along the chain of bringing together the satellite images to um, uh, manipulate them into uh, a map of the world. Um, so essentially, that's uh, yeah. It it just provides an opportunity and opening. And I guess I'm approaching this in a sense from an architect's point of view, because architect in architecture we're using digital tools all the time, and the intention is, in a professional sense, to come up with a, a complete map of the building, which will be executed just as it was imagined. And I think that we accept, uh, everyone understands that this has serious shortcomings, one in terms of creativity, the opportunity for, um, uh, for the people who live in the building to have any say about what goes on, to manipulate the, the, um, the design of the building uh, over time. Um, and I guess that I would sort of contrast that to the understanding, say, of a landscape architect who designs something, uh, a space which will evolve over time and change with the seasons and so on. Architects become, um, uh, start to get sued when the building starts to change. <laughs> <laughs> um, th this has serious shortcomings in terms of architecture having any meaning for real life. So. I guess that I'm, what I'm looking for is an opportunity to break down those systems or to allow those systems to break themselves down. Um, and it, it comes for me in the form of the image. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's sort of. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, and I, 
you know, I think it's I think there's interesting parallels that you have with your work and mm -hmm. your 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 projection work and then your architectural work. Um, just even you bringing up the idea of the you know designing of these buildings and how you talked a lot about the the looking at how space gets demised mm -hmm. on via maps and whatnot. Um, um, yeah, so it does. I, it does make me think about, I guess, just about the the that connection be the, that you're drawing between, you know, um, the digital realm with the pixels and sort of the 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 larger. I think well, I can't remember how you how you put it, but you said something about the mapping was like a, a giant CPU or something. Uh, well, the prairies. <laughs> I mean <laughs> the the. The prairies as they are, were designed, and the next it was a giant processing unit, basically not of information but of materials. Right, right. There's information in there. The choice of crop. It would be interesting to look at it in this way. I think the choice of crops reflects information about the market, information about climate, and so on. So it's uh, not exactly as it is a central processing unit, um, I so in a sense, but of, of materials rather than information. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm just gonna. Um, I, Hugh, I was wondering. Um, it seemed like a lot of the the a lot of the the work that you were showing there was seems like it's really influenced by, or I guess the a, a, a large uh, an important part of it is the spaces that you're working in and trying to solve some of those issues in an interactive way. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how space uh, and you know the your um, I guess the utilization of the spaces that you're having to work within. Um, if you can if you can talk a bit about how that might influence the work that you create or whether it influences it at all. Hmm. Um, yeah, the space is everything. Um, I tr like to use spaces in unconventional ways. I don't necessarily want to have an audience come into a theater and sit in the seats and watch a show in, in a sort of a two-dimensional kind of way, um, which is where the whole idea of everything's coming up roses, because there was no seats in the theater yet. There was nothing, there was literally nothing there except the structure of the theater itself, and it's like, wow, this is fantastic. What can we do with it? Well. <laughs> on you go, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't always have that choice. I mean, it, it, it doesn't, um, um, it's often not up to me sometimes, but sometimes by the time I get involved in a project that the set's been designed, the, uh, the stage, the use of the stage has been designed with the, and the director may have a very specific idea of what they want to try and accomplish through the presentation of the work. In that case, I, I don't really get to choose that at all. But in the t we've worked together on a couple of things, for example, where I really did get to have some influence on, on how the space was used. And even in, even in a conventional sense, even in, even in a, a theater with seats and people facing the stage, there's interesting things you can do to break down barriers and, and um, help to tell the story you know, in a way that hopefully connects with the people who are watching it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you also... Uh, and and it might be interesting to hear from all of you on this, but because um, you had mentioned something about, I guess, sort of the trajectory of your your work from from really sort of basic, uh, more analog means to sort of you know slowly sort of becoming more uh, working in the digital realm. And I'd, I'd be curious to just hear a little bit more about that, or like how how that worked for you in terms of, you know, having to learn learn new things or, or uh, different approaches using different tools? Well, I mean, I suppose like everybody, I've learned new software like Isadora because I was interested in it and thought it was fascinating and wanted to do it. I, on the other hand, refuse to CAD stuff, <laughs> and you have to, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but um, I have a lighting design program that does basic CAD, but I, if my, my line is always, if you want that CAD, you're going to have to hire someone to do it, because I'm not doing it. Because I don't want to spend time learning AutoCAD or VectorWorks, because that bores me senseless. And so it's just about interest, I think. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to, to, to touch on the analog digital thing, it, I still use a lot of analog tools. I love analog tools. I think they're fantastic. But sometimes digital tools are just simpler, easier, more effective, and um, sometimes cheaper. 
Yeah. So I'll use whatever seems to me in the moment to serve the project in the most effective way, artistically effective. Right. Mm -hmm. um, do do either of you have some thoughts about you know I guess like how how you got to <laughs> to using the tools that you're using or or building the tools you're using. Um, and anything that maybe uh, sort of drove you there, whether it was you know ideas or whether it was the technology that called you or what that might have been. Um, <clears throat> I, I think for me it's an, um, it's always the 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 storytelling which was mm. always important. Um, I I used to do puppet making and tell mm. stories through puppets back in the day. Um, and, and I think it's it's and you answer it perfectly, amazingly well. It's basically the time and space we are in, and how technology is just a tool. It's just a medium, right? It's not. It will not do anything unless we know what we really want to do with it. <laughs> so, <Yeah. clears throat> depending on where we are. Um, it's changing so fast, and it's just the tool which we use to tell our stories. And that's how I use it. Yeah. Um, for me, it's uh, every project, I learn a new piece of software or a new way to use the old software. It's rather exhausting. Um, <laughs> and simply because I don't, uh, I can't stay inside the boundaries of the CAD, <laughs> right? I'm just curious what will happen if you do this. Um, and I guess that the way that I've got new knowledge is by uh, through a series of workshops uh, that I've been able to take part in learning from students actually because um, mm -hmm. there are a number of students that have been at the University of Manitoba who are interested in projection mapping also so working with them um, uh, I went to ISEA a couple of years ago um, and uh, there was an opportunity to learn Isodora that's how I ended up falling into that um, but essentially I'm just kind of curious what ways there are, to, and I'm trying to find whatever tool will do. I'm, I'm not driven by the technology, but by the image that I'm trying to create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that um, I, I just so I don't take up all the time. Um, I'm going to open it up to see if, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask um, or, or comments about the, what you've seen. Or heard? It's just a bunch of numbers. Um, and um, so when we tweet, just like a picture, <clears throat> we have inherently producing six, seven type of variables with it. Um, your location, your IP of your phone, your time, your ID name, um, how many people respond to your tweet, how many people like your tweet, how many people commented on your tweet. All this data is part of that API. So you get all these bunch of numbers, bunch of these st strings, and then you kind of look at those and find a meaning out of it the way you want to tell to connect those strings so the tool which I created it allows me to actually bypass all of these things as well because sometimes you're not interested in if you are if you're archiving a, a hashtag which is getting massive traffic uh, the server blocks the the traffic because of the constant data coming in. So you had to find a way to um, to make it uh, easy for the system or a server to run with that numbers. So sometimes you had to hide the comments, sometimes you have to hide the likes, and you only work maybe with the location and whatnot. So, and that's where the power of the tool comes in, right? It allows me to find these ways to play with the data. Uh, so I'm b usually using tools within 
Google standard, uh, you know, graphic user in user interface. It, it's the, the tools are all basically out there um, to capture the images. There's certain technique techniques you have to kind of get used to using in order to, for example, if you're saving, uh, downloading images, uh, you want to avoid doing that as a movie because the compression will just destroy it. Okay. Um, you want to download things as image sequences. Uh, in the control panels or preferences, you know, you can tweak an awful lot of the speed it's moving mm -hmm. across the landscape. So there's a lot you can do within the standard Google tools. Um, but you can also export um, the trajectories that you're saving as uh, KML files, and then you can actually recode those. You can open those in a, in a, a word processing program and rewrite some of the code. Um, I didn't do that for any of the projects I showed here, but it's not a very difficult process. You can also export uh, that data into um, a Excel, for example, and then manipulate the numbers. So you can sort of batch process um, those things rather you know, robustly. So, so I'm mostly working within the, the standard tools within Google, but they're actually tools most people don't use. <laughs> right. um, but then I do a little bit of tweaking on the side, changing the speeds, altitudes, and, and that kind of thing. So the actual movement was actually generated with, within, Google. yes, within Google. If you really want to pull out the imperfections, you know, then you find ways to tweak that. Right. Uh, so, like I was saying, you can uh, you can capture image sequences, okay, or you can capture direct off the screen, which in some ways is more interesting because then you're seeing it image generated right in front of you, that sort of, the things start popping up, it just gets more interesting. So it's a, a matter of finding ways to tweak it so that you're just breaking it just a little bit. Thank you so much to all of the panelists uh, and to all of you for, for uh, coming out on this, on this very wintry day. <laughs>